So today we are going to discuss about non-consequentialist school, otherwise known as deontology. Oftentimes, people misunderstand the word deontology with ontology, particularly our students. Ontology is derived from the Greek word ontos, which means being. So therefore, the study of being is called ontology. Whereas deontology is derived from another Greek word deon, which means duty. So it is a study of duty. In other words, it is a duty-based ethics. Now, Kant is a proponent of this deontology, which is a non-consequentialist theory, which means an action is right or wrong, and it is not dependent on its consequences, but on the actions themselves. Some actions are intrinsically wrong in themselves. I think that is the key point. So no matter what consequences they produce, these actions are wrong. That is the simplest understanding of deontology. He stresses on duty because if you do your duty, then that is the right action. Now I'll explain to you in a moment what this duty is all about. Now you all know Kant is a philosopher of enlightenment. Therefore in enlightenment, reason has primacy. So you need to follow the dictates of reason. You need to listen to what your reason tells you. You don't do something right or wrong because of fear of God, but because you are guided by your reason. So the famous enlightenment motto is sapere aude, audacity to know. So you should have your own understanding about morality of what is right or wrong. Not because somebody has told you this is right or this is wrong, but because you have your own understanding. You should have the courage to have your understanding. So that courage to have your understanding is precisely possible because you have the gift of reason. And because you have the reason, you are the moral sovereign. You give the moral law to yourself. So when Kant speaks about the duty, the duty is not dictated by someone else to you. The duty is something that you discover from within you, because you have the reason. You know the famous statement of Kant. I wonder at two things. The starry skies above me and the moral law within me. So precisely because the moral law is within you, it is part of your reason, and therefore you are a moral sovereign. Sovereign means somebody who, is, who can make decisions on your own without being dictated by someone. And you just need to listen to your reason. You can formulate your own moral law, but there is only one way in which you can do that. You formulate your moral law provided you can make it universal. It is not only applicable to you, but also to everyone else in similar situation. That is the meaning of universalizing the moral law that you formulate. Now for Kant, for example, lying is wrong. It is as wrong or irrational as denying the mathematical truths like 2 plus 2 equals 4. So you cannot debate on that because you know lying is wrong within your reason and you know that this is something you can make it universal. You can never make universal lying is right. I will explain to that in a moment why it is like that. He considers these things as perfect duties. That you cannot lie is a perfect duty for Kant. Because it can be universalized in the perfect way without contradiction. Otherwise you will be contradicting your very statement. I will come to that in a moment. Now what is important for you to retain right now is... Your moral choices are made by the guidance that you receive from your reason, not from any external agency, let alone God. Kant also has this famous idea of goodwill. You know, in philosophy, normally you study about the faculty of reason and the faculty of will. The faculty of reason informs you what is right and what is wrong, but it is the will that chooses to do what is right and wrong. Let me give you an example. Suppose you know 
you know very well, you have all reasons to, to determine or to realize that smoking is injurious to health. The fact that you know it, the fact that you have got enough reasons to support it, does not necessarily lead you to stop smoking. What makes you to stop smoking? It is your will to choose to stop smoking. So the will is your faculty, your ability to choose what you want to do as opposed to what you do not like to do. So therefore the will is related to human freedom. So Kant has this famous you know, postulates, three postulates. If you forgot it, I will refresh your memory. The three postulates are the existence of God, the immortality of soul, and human freedom. Now why does Kant call them postulates? Kant says there is no reason for him to give proofs for this. Not because they are self-evident. He simply says that I don't want to spend my time proving this. Rather, I would like to take them as granted. Because they are important for me to build my philosophy. So I will accept them as something that is true. That is why it is postulate. It is not a proof. God can't never spend his time proving the existence of God. He says it is important that I assume that God exists so that my philosophy becomes meaningful. It is important that I assume that we humans are immortal. Then I can build my philosophy on it. It is also important that I assume that my, I have freedom so that my philosophy becomes meaningful. And this is how you need to understand the goodwill of Kant in the context of freedom. So when he speaks about the goodwill, because you have the ability to choose, because you, are, you have the freedom to choose, which means it is your ability to do your duty. Now what is the ability to do your duty for him? It is out of pure respect for moral law. So when Kant says duty for duty's sake, it means that I do it as a duty, I do an action as a duty because I have the respect for moral law. Again, but remember, moral law is not something given to you by someone else. Moral law is what you discover within you, provided you can universalize it. You discover it within you in the light of reason that you have. That is important. It is not you are emotionally swayed away. It is in the light of reason that you discover. So duty for duty's sake means you do an action as a duty purely out of respect for the moral law that you have within you. Now, without this goodwill, your actions do not have moral worth. Even if you end up doing the right action, it still doesn't have moral worth. If you do it for other reasons like sympathy or love. Now, let me explain to you. Now, let, us, uh, let me give an example. You have an ailing grandmother. You have a brother. And then you visit your ailing grandmother because of purely out of sympathy for her or you have love for her. You don't realize it as your moral duty. You don't realize it is as an imperative for you. Your brother, on the other hand, he does not have sympathy or love for your grandmother as much as you have, but he realizes it is his moral duty to take care of the ailing grandmother. Now, the intention of what makes your brother visit your ailing grandmother is what provides moral worth for this action. Your intention is just you have sympathy for her, that's it. You don't think it as a moral duty. Whereas your brother thinks it as a moral duty. That duty which he discovers from within. Now what is the duty? It is my duty to take care of the ailing family members. Now, which is what your brother has discovered, whereas you have not discovered. So your brother's action of taking care of your ailing grandmother has moral worth, not yours. Or let me give you another example. You have, um, you know, let us say that you are running a shop in the neighborhood. 
Now, you sell things at a fair price. Now, the question is, you are doing the right thing, but is your action something of a moral worth? Kant will say, why do you sell things at a fair price? Why are you not hiking the price? Well, if you say, I am doing it because then people will come to my store and then I will be able to get more clients, then that is not an action of moral worth. Or even if you say, well, in this neighborhood, people are poor, so let me be considerate, let me have sympathy for them, therefore I will sell things at a fair price or a cheap price, that is not of moral worth. But if you say, well, it is my duty not to hike the price, not to loot people's money, well, then your action is of moral worth. Now, that is the important aspect. You do an action because you realize it is your duty, not because you have got ulterior motive of getting more clients, not even you have the motive of being kind to others, but just because you want to do your duty. That's the right thing to do, period. Nothing else. This is the right thing to do because this is my moral duty. Therefore, Kant would say, only goodwill is unconditionally good. Other things can be good, but they are conditionally good. Because power can be good, but power can be corrupted. Courage can be good, but courage can be corrupted. Even intelligence is good, but intelligence also can be corrupted. What is incorruptible is your good will, which comes from your freedom and guided by your reason. Now, this is something that you need to remember in the context of general Kant's philosophy, and in particular, moral philosophy. Now, Kant makes a distinction between two kinds of imperatives. Now, imperative simply means a command. An example of a command is, you must study well. You must not sleep during the day. You must do exercise regularly. Now, these are all imperatives. Now, what is a hypothetical imperative? A hypothetical imperative tells you to do something if you want to achieve certain results. For example, I can tell you, you must study well if you want to get good grades. You must do your physical exercise regularly if you want to remain healthy. So there is a condition that is attached to that command. Only if you want to be healthy, you need to do that. If you don't want to care about your health, you don't need to bother about it. If you don't want to get good grade, you don't need to study. So only on that condition, you need to study, you must study well, or you must do physical exercise regularly. On the other hand, categorical imperative is categorical. It doesn't have a condition attached to it. It is not because you want good grades, you must study well, or it is not because you have to have good health, you need to physical exercise. There are some imperatives which are by all means to be done whether you want any particular result or not. They are categorical imperatives. For example, for Kant, do not commit suicide is a categorical imperative. Or do not lie is a categorical imperative. You must not lie. You must not tell lies. That is a categorical imperative. It is not that you must not tell lies if you want to be a good person. No, there is no such thing. You just, you must not lie. So they are binding absolutely, without exception. That is the meaning of categorical. Hypothetical is binding you only if you have certain wants and needs and desires. Whereas categorical is binding you regardless of your wants and needs. It is absolutely binding you. That is why it is categorical imperative. In that sense, categorical imperatives are universal. If it binds you, it should bind everyone. It is unconditional. It doesn't come with any conditions like if you want to become this, you must do that. It just is, you must do that. And it is a product of rational thought. Why? Because it emerges from the moral law that is within you, that is within your reason, and which you can universalize. And categorical imperatives for Kant are the authoritative expression of your moral duties. There is nothing else that can express your moral duties 
so vividly as categorical imperatives. Now, there are various ways Kant formulates this categorical imperative. Well, different Kantian scholars have different theory. Some say that he formulates in, um, you know, he formulates things like uh, uh, two different formulations he gives. Others say uh, he gives three, others say four. But generally people say he has three formulations of which two are important. Now what are those two formulations? Act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. What does that mean? Now let me explain. What is a maxim? A maxim is a principle or a rule. Okay. Now you should act by a rule. What kind of rule you must act by? A rule which you think can be made a universal law. If you can act by that rule, it means everybody else can be act by that rule. So you can make it universal. It is universalizable. The rule that you follow must be followed by everyone consistently in similar situations. It also means that if you think you can act by that rule, you are willing everybody else to act by that rule. So you treat everybody in the same way as you treat yourself. That is also equally important. That's the first formulation. The second formulation is treat humanity, whether in your own self or in that of other person, as an end in itself and never merely as means. In simple words, treat the human persons as ends in themselves. They are never merely a means. Now, note the word merely is important because we keep using one another. For example, you are using me right now for gaining knowledge. Or we use a, a taxi driver to drive us somewhere else. But then we are not merely using him for our purpose. Objects is what we use for our purpose. I have a mobile phone. I mean, it doesn't matter how I treat that mobile phone. It exists just for me. But humans exist for themselves. Therefore, you cannot just treat them like the object. So it is merely as means. We do make use of one another as means for a certain thing. But humans have intrinsic moral worth. That's what it means. All people have equal intrinsic moral worth. They are morally worthy and it is intrinsic. It is not dependent on anything. It is by the fact of being human. And humans are free, rational, autonomous agents. They are freedom, they are rational, they have reason, and they are all they have also the ability to make autonomous choices on their own. Now, there is a moral difference between treating persons as a means and as a means only. I explained that. So we don't use people only as means, but we do make use of each other because we need one another, we help one another, but with recognizing that each person has an intrinsic moral worth. So these are the two formulations of categorical imperative. These are absolutely binding. I limit to these two formulations because the third one is a little complicated and that I don't expect you to know at this stage of your BPH. Now Kant also speaks about perfect and imperfect duties. Now, when you speak about duty, you should realize Kant is not referring to duty in the sense Eichmann would refer to duty. Who is Eichmann? Eichmann is the one of the chief commander, uh, commander in chief in the Nazi army. He was responsible for deporting the Jews to the concentration camp and eventually to their death. Now, Eichmann's model of duty is, I am told by my superiors, so I do it. That is Eichmann's model of duty. Somebody else has imposed a duty on me. Now, Hitler has told me this is what I should do, and I work for Hitler, and therefore I should do. You become merely a slave of somebody else's dictate. Kant's model of duty is something that is imposed by yourself on yourself. It is self-imposed. Why? Because the moral law is within you. 
somebody does not tell you what you should do what you shouldn't do you discover that within you and therefore you impose it on yourself it is freely embraced it is not something that you need to accept because somebody else said your tradition says or your uh, superior say no it's something that you discover from within you and remember duty is not an inclination some people confuse duty with inclination i am inclined to do it now i am inclined to do it is your desire now duty is something that you discover because of the reason desire can be merely emotional we can be swayed away by emotion but duty is something that you need to discover by the right use of reason so it is not an inclination in that context can't say there are perfect duties and imperfect duties now both are categorical but perfect duties you must absolutely do without fail imperfect duties you must do provided the situation permits you to do so that would be an imperfect duty now perfect duty in all situations you must absolutely do without fail now can't formulate the perfect duty in negative terms for example you would say you should not break promise now it is said in negative promise keeping is a perfect duty and you should never break promise for can't why is that you should never break promise because if you break promise you cannot do it by contradicting yourself you say well we can break promise and you say i will make it universe, universal now if everybody else keep breaking promise then absolutely then nobody would ever trust anyone that is going to create absolute mess in the society so the whole idea of keeping the promise itself is called into question and therefore not to break promise is a perfect duty you must follow without fail because breaking promise would contradict itself you must not lie this is again an absolute duty for can't even if somebody's life is at risk you must not lie there is a famous example that is often said about i mean cartel himself writes about it there is a innkeeper where one of the persons is staying and another person is trying to come to kill him in the inn now you are the innkeeper now the person who comes to murder the other one who is staying in your inn ask you if this person is in your inn for can't if the person is inside your inn you must say yes you must not lie you might evade answering and try to talk to that person not to murder him and so on but you must not say no he is not here now can't explain this way why you should not lie because suppose you say that the person who is sought after to be murdered is not there let us call that person peter so peter who is actually inside your inn realizes the murderer let us call the murderer paul paul is at the doorstep of the inn he realizes that and he tries to escape through the back door and then as he comes here paul listening to your answer leaves the inn and both of them meet on the street paul ends up shooting peter now can't you say it is your lie that has caused peter his death now suppose if you have said the truth then this person paul will try to go and figure out where peter is and go and see peter could escape or even if peter is, is is he did not escape even if paul shoots peter you have no part to play in that you just did your duty of telling the truth you did not cause his death whereas in the previous thing your lie caused his death now you should not lie so why it is because if you say well we can lie you cannot do it without contradiction because everybody will keep lying to one another all the time and therefore there is no way in which you can really lead a life that is based life based on mutual trust and acceptance so that would be a total contradiction the third one not to commit suicide my again this is also a contradiction for kant 
to say that uh, we can commit suicide because why do you say you want to commit suicide? Because I am completely upset with my life. Then Kant would say, well, by ending your life, are you going to gain your life? That would be a contradiction and then you can never make that universal. Now these three things, at least Kant specifically mentions, are perfect duties. You should never break promise, you should never lie, you should not commit suicide. Well, there are problems attached to it, but this is what, what Kant holds. Now, imperfect duties have some perfections. Kant formulates the imperfect duties in positive terms. For example, develop your talents. You must develop your talents. Sure, but provided the conditions are right for you. You cannot develop your talents in a situation where there is absolute chaos and war. But if it is there, you must develop your talents. Help others in need. For example, if somebody is drowning in a river, you must help the person in need, provided you know swimming. That is important. That is why it is not a perfect duty, because the condition should be favorable to you. If you don't know swimming, if you jump there, you will risk both your life and the person who is already struggling there. So that's why they are imperfect duties. Now let us try and apply the deontological theory of Kant. Let us take the same case which we discussed the other day. Capturing the deadly terrorist. You all remember the case. The deadly terrorist has been going around killing people and people are terrorized. And the special police team is appointed for that. They are not able to capture him. Now they decide they could therefore arrest the innocent members of his family, start torturing one by one and eventually even kill if necessary to make sure that the deadly terrorist turns himself in so that people are living fearlessly. Now let us look at this case and see whether as a Kantian, a deontologist, what the police does can be seen as right or wrong. In order to do that, we need to look at both formulations of the categorical imperative. And then keep in mind the formulation of the categorical imperative and apply it to the case. Now, if you use the formulation of the first formulation of the categorical imperative, act in such a way that your maxim may be willed as a universal law. Act by a particular rule, that rule can be made a universal law. Now what is the rule here that you formulate? When normally arresting, techniques for arresting a terrorist fails, we should or the authorities should torture, kill the family members of the terrorist. Now you ask yourself whether this can be universalized. Now this is the rule by which the police force is doing that. When normal course of action fails to arrest the deadly terrorist, we should torture, kill the family members. Now let us test this categorical imperative. Can we make this rule, this maxim, as a universal law? Well, you may probably do that. The consequences may be unpleasant, but after all, Kant is not interested in the consequences. This may pass the test here. Well, one may say, well, if that is the last resort, it's my duty that I should do that. Even though the consequences are unpleasant, but Kant is least interested in the consequences. But look at the second formulation of the categorical imperative. Never treat human beings merely as means, but always as end in themselves. Treat human beings always as ends in themselves. Thus, this formulation, when the normal course of action to arrest a deadly terrorist fails, we should kill the family members of, innocent family members of the terrorist. Does it violate this categorical, formulation of categorical imperative? Does it treat people merely as means. Yes, it does. The family members of the deadly terrorists are merely treated as means, as though they have no intrinsic worth, as though they have no dignity as human persons. All those things are violated. And therefore, this particular action is wrong by the categorical imperative of Kant. So therefore, what, how do you conclude? Torturing innocent lives or killing innocent lives are wrong no matter 
how many lives you may save by doing that. So that is the conclusion. So Kant would never uh, ever allow to permit you to torture or kill innocent lives, even if you can save millions of lives. Now let us evaluate the deontology of Kant. Is it consistent with considered moral judgment? Whether it is consistent with common moral experience? It is not consistent with considered moral judgment. Because perfect duty allows you no exception. And then considered moral judgment would say every law will have an exception. In fact, what makes a law a good law is that it provides exception. Now perfect duties are moral laws that have no exception at all. So therefore it is not consistent with considered moral judgment. It is not even consistent with cons uh, common moral experience. Now, Kant says you should never lie. Now what happens? If you want to prevent a tragedy, can you lie? For example, you know that one of your friends is having a serious health crisis. But telling him the truth is going to make his health even worse. Can you lie in that situation? Kant would say no. But common moral sense, moral experience would say no. In order to prevent the tragedy, I should lie to the person in this case. Or even keeping a promise. You have promised your girlfriend that you would go for a dinner date with her today. But you suddenly realize that somebody close to you is seriously admitted to the hospital. Kant would say, never break a promise. You have promised that you would have a dinner date with your girlfriend. But another situation demands that you break the promise now because which is more pressing, more urgent. Now common moral experience tells us that we can break a promise in certain situation but Kant would say no. Therefore it is not inconsistent with common moral experience. Well, it is not even useful in solving problems. If two perfect duties come in conflict with one another, let us say not lying, not breaking promise, if both come in conflict. Let's say in order not to break a promise, you have a situation in which you must lie. Let's say you have promised someone that you would never hurt that person. Now the person asks you whether the person looks beautiful, elegant. Well, if you tell the truth, you are not beautiful or elegant, you are breaking the promise not to hurt the person. But if you tell the lie, if you don't tell the truth, then you are lying. So these are two perfect duties for Kant. So both can come in conflict with each other. There is no way out to resolve this conflict. There is also a certain amount of subjectivity in the formulation of categorical imperative. Because how do you formulate the categorical imperative? To what extent you can nuance that formulation of the categorical imperative? Now when we speak about the formulation of categorical imperative, I am not saying the two formulations that Kant says. But in every case, you try to appropriate that formulation for your purpose. Like for example, I said in the case of capturing the deadly terrorist, I said when the normal course of action fails to capture a deadly terrorist, we should kill or torture the innocent family members. Now, how, this is very subjective. Is there any better way of formulating it? Others would formulate it slightly differently, perhaps by saying we should kill or torture the family members provided they are accomplice. Okay, now you are nuancing there. So there is a lot of subjectivity that can come in the formulation of the particular cases where you formulate the categorical imperative. There is also a problem with means and principle. Kant says we should never you know, treat people merely as means. But what happens in a situation when you have to kill the Nazi guard to let the Jewish prisoners escape. You are treating that person merely as means here because you don't think of his life, his intrinsic worth as a human person. No, because you are, you know, helping the prisoners escape rather than letting them die. So there is some kind of problem here is there. Or what happens like in a situation, pandemic situation, if somebody is a carrier of COVID-19, you need to isolate the person so that others don't get infected. You don't see, oh, that person has a moral intrinsic worth, let me go and hug him and handshake with him 
we put him in, in isolation. So we are treating him as merely as a carrier of disease in that point in time. That means merely as a means. We are not thinking of his moral worth, of his dignity and so on at that point in time. So there is also a problem with this means and principle, at least in some cases. Now what do we learn from Kant? Definitely we learn universality. This is something very important. Moral law applies to all people in relevant situations. It is not applied to some people and not to other people. Sometimes we think rules apply to others, not to ourselves. You know, we oblige others to do certain things because that's a moral law. But then when it comes to us, we say, fine, I don't do it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Universality means moral law applies to all persons. It doesn't make discrimination among morally relevant persons in similar situations. Again, it is impartial. It applies to everyone in the same way. No one can claim any privileged moral status. I don't have any privileged moral status than you do. So we all have the same moral status and therefore it is absolutely impartial. And more importantly, this is my favorite, the respect for human persons. In fact, we may not realize Kant is singularly responsible for the charter of human rights we have today in the United Nations. Actually, it is based on Kant's philosophy. So the whole idea of how human persons have dignity, how they have certain inalienable rights, they have ultimate value in themselves. And these things are important. And these things are powerfully more important than any consequentialist approach, that human persons have intrinsic moral worth. This is something, a great contribution from Kant. I have completed Kant, but let me move on to, we have few minutes left, another 20 minutes or so, I shall try to complete another deontological thinker, a kind of Kantian scholar called Sir William David Ross, commonly known as W.D. Ross. Now you find this uh, photo here, yeah. Now. He is trying to set Kant right. One of the major problems with Kant is that certain duties are absolute. So therefore it becomes difficult in life situations. So Ross comes with this idea, with Kantian approach, but then he says, well, all duties are prima facie duties. No duty in itself is absolute. All duties are prima facie. Now what is prima facie? Prima facie means they are duties at the very first glance of it. You know, you recognize this as duty because of your reason. You know it by what he calls by your very intuition. You realize it is, you know intuitively it is your duty to help your parents, take care of your parents. Now, that is a duty, duty at the very sight. Duty at the moment you hear it, you know, helping the parents, you say, yeah, it's a duty. So it is recognizable at the very first moment itself. That's what prima facie duties. But, he says, prima facie duties are not unconditional or absolute. They are conditional. They are not absolute. They may change depending on the context. The context determines whether that prima facie duty, is the, which is a duty in its duty, definitely is, whether I should absolutely do it or not, is determined by the context. Now, for example, should I lie to the gunman to protect the intended innocent victim? The case of the, in, in, uh, the story of the innkeeper, which I told you a few minutes ago. Kant would say, well, do not lie is a duty, yes, but it is not an absolute duty, it is a prima facie duty, it is a conditional duty. Somebody's mic is on. Somebody's mic is on, turn it please. Okay, that is the trouble when you suddenly turn off your mic, you will inter interrupt the whole class on the recording. Please don't turn on your mic. Okay, prima facie duties are conditional. They are not absolute. They are dependent on the context. In this context, now, 
lying is a, not lying is a duty but protecting innocent life is also a duty now two duties come in conflict now ca ross would say both are duties yes but in this given context one duty is more binding than the other so for him protecting innocent life in the situation is more binding than the other duty that is why no duty in itself is absolute every duty is conditional but in a given context one duty becomes absolute so it is the context that determines which duty becomes the absolute this approach is known as the contextual sensibility you are sensible to the context in which you exercise your moral duty now ross gives a list of seven prima facie duties these are duties that you must follow one of them becomes the overriding duty the most important duty in a given context now which are those seven prima facie duties now why these seven why they are not more well at least ross thought these are important for him the first prima facie duty all prima facie duties are duties that you know intuitively they are duties at the very first sight of it but they are conditional in the given context it may become an absolutely binding duty now the first prima facie duty is fidelity or faithfulness you should be faithful to the promises that you make the second one is gratitude you should always say thank you that's a way of showing appreciation for the help that you have received from someone reparation if you have done something wrong to someone you should repair it you should repair the damage you should somehow make up for the wrong things that you have done suppose i have borrowed your cycle and i broke it i should make sure either i pay the repair cost or get a new cycle for you that's what making up for the wrong things done justice you need to be impartial to everyone which means you treat everybody equally and make sure everybody gets happiness in the right way beneficence beneficence means being kind to others that we are being helpful to others for example when there is a natural disaster or a pandemic that you try and reach out to people that means you are beneficent you are kind non maleficence this is the opposite of beneficence non maleficence means you should not do harm to others that is a prima facie duty the last one is not a very important one this was later added by him in the list self improvement or self fulfillment you must engage in activity that improves yourself that fulfills yourself now ross does not think these things are you know are ranked in a particular order as though fidelity is more important than gratitude or gratitude is more important than reparation he just gives this some and some prime of achi duties but then he says if you are a morally mature person that means capable of using your reason in the right way then you can intuitively know that these are prima facie duties and you also will intuitively know that in a given context what is the most urgent duty to be fulfilled what is the most important duty to be fulfilled especially when there is a conflict between conflict between duties that is called as overriding duty the duty which rides over other duties the duty which takes precedence over other duties now some objections are there to this approach of ross and ross or rossian scholars give also a response to that the first objection is now why these seven are prima facie duties what is the logic about this now the response rossian scholars would give is well the list is not necessarily complete ross has given us a few of the prima facie duties you can add and you can never think that these are you know kind of dogmatic principles only these seven no so you don't need to think the list is complete and therefore argue there is no reason why only these seven if you want you can add more the second objection is well there is no actual principle for determining which should be the overriding duty or the most important duty in a given context now ross does not tell us is there any particular way by which you can decide is there a principle you can apply by deciding when there is a conflict between two duties by using this principle that you can determine this duty as the most important duty in the given context he doesn't give 
Now the Rossian scholars will respond to that by saying, well, every context is very different. So we cannot assume that every context or a situation is going to be the same so that their principle can be given in order to determine the overriding duty. So if you are a mature person, obviously, you know how to decide. Mature in the sense of morally capable person in terms of using your reason. Then you must be able to decide which is the most important duty or the overriding duty. The third objection is, well, how can we be sure that these prima facie duties are accurate? What makes you think these are prima facie duties? How do you come to conclude these are prima facie duties? Now, Rossian scholars would say there are certain things that are self-evident. It, it doesn't need further explanation. They are self-evident. Just like I exist is self-evident, these prima facie duties exist is self-evident. Or like mathematical truths are self-evident. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is self-evident. So also these prima facie duties are self-evident. It doesn't need any explanation whatsoever. Now, if you have a mature mind, morally speaking, then it will be known to you. Just because some moral theories do not go along with this line, we cannot give up what is self-evident. There are certain things self-evident, certain moral theories may not recognize that. That doesn't mean we should give up these self-evident prima facie duties. Now let us evaluate the moral theory. Gladly or happily, it passes all the three criteria. It passes the test of all three criteria. Is it consistent with considered moral judgment? Yes, it is consistent with considered moral judgment. What did the considered moral judgment say? Well, not every duty can be absolutely binding because there are certain contexts which would make us revise certain duties as not binding in a given context. Is it consistent with common moral experience? Of course it is consistent with common moral experience because all the time we try to see which is the best thing I need to do in a given context. We don't, we don't live as are contextual people, we live in a given context and we try to assess, that's a common moral experience. And it's very helpful in problem solving, especially when there is a conflict between two duties. All that you need to find is what is more urgent now for me to fulfill. But there is another problem. Ross uh, relies extremely on the idea of we know what is a duty by intuition. Now, intuitions is a very tricky thing because different people have different kind of intuitions. And even our intuitions are determined by the way we are raised in a certain culture or the way we gain certain experience. So how do we know whether we can trust this intu intuition? Suppose we intuit that this boy, guy is a bad guy. How do I trust my intuition? Because I may have had a previously a bad experience with someone similar to him. So therefore I just am blindly letting my previous experience allow me to decide that way. So can we trust our intuitions? Are not people's intuitions very different sometimes? Are they not conditioned by the culture in which we are raised? So that is a problem especially when we rely on intuition as it does. The more of that we will discuss a little later, time being that's enough. Now, I want to make a last word here. I kept repeating the idea of context. Therefore, the, you have to be sensible to the context. The decision that you make, what is the absolutely binding duty, can be different from context to context. Now, that is known as, I told you, contextual sensibility, which is different from situation ethics. I am just giving you a warning, because oftentimes people mix up these two concepts. Situation ethics is another moral school. Technically, that is not an important school at all, and I don't like to discuss it here, partly because it is a school that is condemned by the church, but also it is philosophically untenable. Only to bring out the distinction between these two, what Ross says is about contextual sensibility. But situation ethics, as developed by Fletcher and Robinson, has a technical meaning. 
It is a theory which says all the moral decision you do must be guided by agape or noble love. Whatever you do, if you do in the most loving way, then that is morally correct. That's all it means. That is very different from contextual sensibility of Ross. Situation ethics is a technical term. It only means whatever you do, the most loving way or the most loving thing to do in a given situation is the right thing. Now, what would be the most loving thing to do is very subjective. For each person, it can be very different. Now, Fletcher, for example, gives an example of sacrificial adultery. A woman is arrested and put in the camp in Poland. And then the soldiers tell her she is having five cute children, very young, and if she is not, there is nobody to take care of them. And then she is pleading with them. They say, okay, we release you, we will send you back home, provided you commit adultery with us, you sleep with us, we will send you back home. Now Fletcher would say, what is the most loving thing to do here? As a mother, she has to go back home. So in order to go back home to take care of her child, because of that, in the most loving thing for her to do is to yield to the demands of the soldier. That means to literally accept to lie with them, to sleep with them, so that she can go back home and take care of her children. Now, this very subjective way in which it is kind of uh, construed and there is a certain individualistic approach and it is not consistent with uh, considered moral judgment. So that is the criticism that was given by Pope Pius XII at that time when this was brought out. Well, Protestants gave the criticism mostly quoting the Bible verses and so on. Love is the fulfillment of law, so therefore you cannot interpret love as a very subjective way. What is law? You have to follow and so on. Uh, Barclay came with a very important criticism on this. You cannot be swayed away by irrational emotions. There should always be certain norms to follow. You cannot simply say, well, do what is the most loving thing to do. So people may end up, you know, killing others because it's the most loving thing to do. Well, my grandfather is uh, seriously sick, he's struggling, he's not able to breathe, he's in pain. Let me shoot him and kill him. And that's the most loving thing to do. Well, People can end up you know, doing things in the wrong way. So that is what uh, this will lead to. So that is only about situation ethics. Don't bother about it. All that I wanted you to know is this is different from contextual sensibility of Ross. With that, I come to conclude the lecture. So if you have got any question, you could uh, ask me. But again, as I tell you, some people, you know, I don't know why you have to turn off your mics. You are disturbing the entire class by turning on your mics. So please make sure you don't turn on the mic, especially when I am recording the class. Okay, I have uh, completed this lecture. I have a few minutes for you for question and answer. Now it is 10.26. Uh, I think by another 15 minutes or so we can have question and answer. But before we take the question and answer, I will stop the recording so we can engage in a discussion. Thank you very much.